Welcome to the Ernst & Young Thought Leaders Series with host Mark Thompson. In this audio program, we'll meet many of the best-known thought leaders in the industry and gain valuable insights from CEOs who are driving innovative companies. Dr. Ray Withy was appointed CEO of Upgenix in May 2002. Prior to that, Dr. Withy was at Cell Genesis and Genzyme Corporation. He holds an undergraduate degree in chemistry and biochemistry, along with a PhD in biochemistry, both from the University of Nottingham. The fundamentals in biotechnology remain very strong. There's an enormous amount of innovation in the industry. The key thing now is to really successfully build value. We truly believe that companies need to focus, focus on what it is they can do better than somebody else. We could have made the decision to move outside of our key area of focus of antibodies. But we realized that by focusing on each of the aspects to enable antibody drug development, we can truly realize value. So we focused on discovery. We've optimized our technology for creating antibodies. We've also focused on enabling the manufacture of antibodies, something that was holding back potentially a lot of adoption of antibodies within the industry. And then finally, we've become very good at learning how to move antibodies through the early stages of the development cycle. So by focusing, rather than trying to quickly move into a later stage small molecule or adopting another technology, by optimizing and streamlining what we knew we could do best, we believe that we're uh, building value. Tell me a little bit about those partnerships. What do you envision and how has that changed? In the past, we've looked at a development stage company's revenues as a sign of the health of the company. Often, however, companies are successfully developing products, for example, in the context of co-development deals, where they're offsetting very significant amounts of their development dollars, but that's never seen as revenues. So almost revenues are only useful if within that company you have a demand business of which revenues are a reflection of the demand. If in fact your long-term uh, goal is to get therapeutic products onto the market, then the key is how to preserve your capital, offset enough of your expenses so that you can get enough of those products through development. The best way that we know how to do that is in the context of robust development partnerships that are geared towards a common goal of getting products to the market. Do you think more of those will be biotech to pharma or biotech to biotech deals or a combination of both? I think it's going to be a combination in both. We've seen an increase in trend of biotech to biotech deals and I think that will continue. The top nine biotechs have clearly broken away from the pack, become even more prominent as we've seen a, a flight to positive cash flow. And so many more of those companies uh, will be looking to development stage biotech companies to help feed their pipelines. Have you had to cut any of your promising product development programs because of the change in the capital market tones or suspend them in the short term? In the new environment, we need to spread the risk of drug development across multiple partners. And so we are looking to continue to build and streamline our alliance network. We're almost viewing ourselves as growing abgenics within the context of a fully integrated biopharmaceutical network of alliances and moving beyond uh, a FIBCO model or many of the other models that were um, invented over the last 10, 15 years. It's not a question of using it for survival or just to build infrastructure. We actually think it's a better structure. And that's the... It's intriguing. It is very much like the maturity curve the high tech absolutely. industry went through. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was, you know, if you go back to Amgen and Procrit, that was survival. Yeah. And absolutely. now it's something else. Yeah, absolutely. It's an intriguing comment. Sounds a lot like a concept that we've seen in the other sectors of the high-tech environment that are more mature, whether that's software or semiconductors. Do you think that's relevant, and is that really new? It's uh, not new in other industries, and you could argue that 
a network of alliances have been there since day one in biotech, and that is very true. I think we can learn a lot from the past in terms of biotech of the 1980s. And a lot of biotech from the 1980s, biotech companies were built up with using partnerships. In many cases, however, many companies were to become like their pharma partners. There's another concept, which is within the context of a network, you're actually focusing on that part of the value chain that you do best and work out an economic model that will eventually lead to positive cash flow, not wishing to become like the fully integrated partner by focusing on what you do best. And so it's a different way to look at alliances. You had mentioned the um, big pharmaceutical companies and you talked about the restructuring of the biopharmaceutical industry. I would contend it's broader than that. What are your thoughts? How is that going to shake out? And what is the pharmaceutical side of this equation going to look like in the future? We have some, as you know, some very significant trends that are shaping the restructuring. The R&D productivity in pharma has reached a point where one can almost begin to speculate as to whether the economics of drug development work anymore. That is compounded by the fact that we are saturated with information, genomic information, proteomic information, which at the moment does not seem to be translatable into more efficient, rapid or cost-effective product development. In some cases, it's potentially making the matters worse. Perhaps some of the greatest fruits of all this information is that we're going to reclassify many diseases and what many markets are potentially going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Therefore, biotech companies that are focusing on efficiency, streamlining, and adding their piece to making the drug development process efficient or adding significant value in the context of this, uh, of, a, of a overall biopharmaceutical industry in which R&D productivity is almost grinding to a halt. What will a biotech company look like 10 years from now? Possibly a top tier biotech company in 10 years from now may not be as big as today's companies. They may be more efficient, hopefully, they will be working closer and closer with partners rather than trying to do everything themselves, both small partners and large partners, and be working within the context of a, a microeconomy that is producing positive cash flow for them. So we're going to see a lot more smaller, profitable companies, I believe. Going back a little bit to alliances and partnerships, do you see the large biotechs and big pharma companies partnering or willing to talk about partnering earlier in the product development cycle, whether that be preclinical or early stage clinical trials? Yes, we do. And in fact, we think that that is a, a huge opportunity for companies right now in the partnering space. And at first, it may seem counterintuitive. In terms of the regulatory environment at the FDA, what do you see? Is it positive? Is it negative? What are the trends? Well, it's certainly tremendously positive that we have now had a commissioner appointed and a commissioner who seems to have uh, come out of the blocks running. Ray, you've been in this industry for a long period of time. How has running a biotech company changed in the last 10 years? There's, I think, a increased reality that it is okay to build a company that isn't going to look like a pharmaceutical company. And I think one of the major transitions that has been made, I don't know whether it's the last 10 years or 5 years or whatever, is to find ways to build a company that isn't just a clone of the past, but is a company that works in the future. And it's about managing your assets effectively. And no matter which way you cut it, the, the primary asset uh, is the, the people. And uh, managing, uh, leading, and actually in today's environment, finding ways that everybody become leaders within the company is probably one of our most interesting but exciting challenges. In the decade ahead, the innovation of new ways of operating will be as important as technology innovation. 